How's everybody doing today? Good to be back. Miss last week. Felt like dirt. Now I, I still feel like dirt, but I'm here. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord for that. And we'll continue our study here on the uh, pre-tribulation rapture. We've looked at a lot of material over the past four lessons on it. And uh, I've been trying to build the case, build the case for the pre-trib rapture, the, what's called the blessed hope is what Paul called it in uh, Titus chapter number 2 and uh, and to develop the difference between Old Testament saints, church age saints, and tribulation saints. We've also examined the, uh, the teaching of the historicist or the, the preterist and the other groups who believe differently than we do. And, and, and we've tried to look at that in the light of Scripture, but today we're going to get into a, a little history. And uh, I'm going to be reading some stuff to you here that I got off some websites that hate our doctrine, that think that we're devils, that think that we're uh, preaching the doctrine of Antichrist when we say that we believe that the Lord is going to catch the church out before the tribulation period begins. Now, I mean, a lot of them people, good, good, good Christian brethren, you know, and, and uh, I love them in the Lord, but brother, I think they're wrong. I believe they're wrong. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you, Lord, that you would help us to uh, examine this subject carefully, Father. Lord, you know, as always, we come before you not uh, necessarily seeking to... Uh, promote a particular position, Lord, but in, in a search for truth. That's what we want. We want the truth from the Word of God, Lord. We know that it's far superior to any denominational persuasion, any doctrines cooked up by men. And Father, we pray that that's what you give us through the course of these lessons, Lord. I pray that you bring to remembrance the things that we learned when we studied the covenant God of Israel and your relationship to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the promises, the covenants, and uh, all the things that pertain to that because we have to view all prophecy as it is as being interwoven and come to a conclusion based on Scripture. Now, Lord, help this day us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. I've done... A bit of research on this stuff, I guess, you know. I, I, I've studied uh, the writings of a lot of the, the uh, people who have the opposite position that we hold. And I went to a page yesterday, and I downloaded some stuff I want to read to you. And uh, I'll just do it here. This is uh, from a... Uh, a, a, a website that promotes the uh, post-tribulation rapture of the church, and they've got a completely different take on it than we do. It says, in modern, Christian modern Christianity has largely forgotten the importance of the Protestant Reformation, which took place during the 1500s. The 16th century presents the spectacle of a stormy sunrise after a dismal night. Europe awoke from... A uh, long sleep of superstition. The dead arose. The witnesses to truth who had been silenced and slain stood up once more and renewed their testimony. The martyred confessors reappeared in the reformers. There was a cleansing of the spiritual sanctuary. Civil and religious liberty were inaugurated. The discovery of printing and revival of learning accelerated the movement. There was progress everywhere. Columbus struck out across the ocean and opened a new hemisphere to view. Rome was shaken on her seven hills and lost one half of her dominions. Protestant nations were created. The modern world was called into existence. Well, they make the Reformation period sound like the institution of the millennium, don't they? I mean, the idea that... Uh, the, there were civil and religious liberties inaugurated 
in that is one that we'll look at a little later in the lesson today. And you tell me just how much liberty there was. Next paragraph. For almost a thousand years, Europe had been ruled by the iron hand of Rome. Only a few Bibles existed then, and Christianity was largely permeated with superstition. Faith in Jesus Christ, heartfelt appreciation for his love and simple trust in his death on the cross were almost unknown. The New Testament truth about grace, full forgiveness, and the free gift of eternal life to believers in the Son of God had been buried under a mass of tradition. Then Martin Luther arose like a lion in Germany after a period of tremendous personal struggle. Martin Luther began teaching justification by faith in Jesus Christ, being declared just by God rather than through reliance on creature merits or any human works. And I, w I wish that I'd thought to bring it. I have a copy of Martin Luther's small catechism for the Lutheran church, you know, and you got to always watch out for these cathetical uh, religions. When you've got a, a catechism, that means if you're an adult, you have to, in, in essence, take an examination before you're accepted into the church. You, they have to make up that you dot all the I's and cross all the T's and all this stuff. If you're born into that type of church, of course, the reformers who broke completely from Rome, yeah, right, they take you when you're a little baby and they baptized you by sprinkling you with water. They, and that's not baptism. You don't take somebody, stand them up against a tree and throw a shovel of dirt on them and say you buried them. <laughs> you dig a hole and you put them under. Baptism is a picture and a type of burial. Uh, and being risen again to newness of life Amen. in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the reformers who they're praising so greatly here, if you go to a true reformed church, to a Lutheran church, to a, a, a Dutch reformed church, any church of that nature, you're going to find that they baptize little babies, and when they're baptized, they believe that just as the Catholics do, that they have received the initial saving grace from the Lord Jesus Christ and are accepted as members of the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth. That's nonsense. Where did they get that? They got it from Rome. They got it from Rome. Uh, Martin Luther in his catechism makes this very clear. And if you ever read John Calvin's catechism, I've got that at home. I wish I'd have brought them. I do. Uh, if you'd read that, you'd find that he says exactly the same things. That the little babies there have to be baptized in order to be saved. And once they're baptized, everything's done. They've received the graces of God, and all they have to do is grow up, and if they're a good child, then that's evidence that they're elect, and if they're a bad child, then obviously they weren't one of the elect. Nonsense. Catholic, that's the very superstition that they were condemning and standing against. A poet back... Uh, who during the uh, after the Reformation period, who they hated, I mean they really hated. He said this. He said that Luther and Calvin opposed the excesses of the Pope and wanted to get rid of him because of his monstrous reign over Christianity. But they replaced him with other popes, making themselves little popes in their various regions who ruled with an iron fist. And that's a very true statement. Now, let's get down to prophecy and, and the things that deal with our pre-trib rapture here. Eventually, Martin Luther turned to the prophecies. By candlelight, he read about the little horn, the man of sin, and the beast, and he was shocked as the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart. Finally, he saw the truth and said to himself, why, these prophecies apply to the Roman Catholic Church. As he wrestled with this new insight, the voice of God echoed loudly in his soul, saying, preach the word. And so at the risk of losing his life, Martin Luther publicly and in print to an astonished uh, people that papal Rome was indeed the Antichrist of Bible prophecy because of this dual 
message of salvation through the through faith in Jesus Christ apart from works and the papal Rome being the Antichrist, the river of history literally changed its course. That is not true. He did not believe in salvation apart from baptism, apart from taking the Eucharist. They still take the Eucharist. He didn't believe in it apart from the church by simple faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you weren't a member of the organized church, that he, uh, Calvin, Zwingli, and all those other men were the heads of. If you weren't in that church, you were going to hell. Period. Period. And uh, it goes on to say, because of this dual message of sal well, okay, hundreds of thousands of people in Europe and in England left the Catholic Church, and amen, they should have. They should have. Now, the thing is, though, not the, the very name of the Reformation is telling. They didn't seek about to separate themselves completely from the great whore, from Babylon the Great, the, the false church. They simply rejected the head of that church and then took the practices over here and made themselves head of other churches that followed the same traditions. I as a Christian, don't think that Rome has ever been the Christian church, the body of Christ. I've studied its history from its inception, from Constantine forward, and I've seen nothing in their history that would lead me to believe that these men received anything by apostolic succession or otherwise. The claim that they laid on Christianity was based on force of arms. The fact that Constantine, the Roman emperor, had the power to squish all opposition and to take Eusebius, who was his right-hand man, who was uh, uh, the, the priest that stayed there with him, and elevate him to a position of authority religiously, and then join those two together to form the Roman Catholic Church, which is now taking the place of the ancient Roman Empire, is obvious. It's obvious what happened. But outside of that group, that you had the Waldenses, the Albigenses, Moravians, all kinds of these little sects that were scattered throughout the French Alps and uh, throughout uh, uh, the, the Eastern Hemisphere over uh, in the Byzantine area of the world who were never part of Rome, never part of Rome. And Roman historians deny that every one of those groups were Christian at all. They condemn them. They condemn them. Therefore, the world at large doesn't recognize them as Christian because when the world thinks church, what do they think? They think Rome. Why do they think that? Because it's comfortable to them. Why do they think that? Because that's what the historians for the last 1,500 years have been telling them. That Rome is the church. And it's not. It never has been the church. You cannot take Rome, reform it, and have the body of Christ. It won't happen. Amen. Won't happen. Won't happen. Now, let's get down here. Let's see, what was the next one? Okay. There are two great truths that stand out in the preaching that brought about the Protestant Reformation. American Bible commentator Walfoot Woodrow reminds us, the just shall live by faith, not by the works of Romanism in the papacy, and the papacy is the Antichrist of Scripture. It is a message for Christ and against Antichrist. The entire Reformation rests upon this twofold testimony. It has been said that the Reformation first discovered Jesus Christ, and then in the blazing light of Christ, it discovered the Antichrist. This mighty spirit-filled movement for Christ against the Antichrist shook the world. They discovered Jesus Christ. Where was the church before the Reformation, please? Home, Where was it? Well, I, either they have to say, well, the church was Rome. It really was Rome, and the church was fully under the power of the spirit of hell instead of the spirit of Christ. Or there was no church. No one was saved until we came along. What's it going to be, boys? 
It's got to be one or the other. You can't have it both ways. Now, I th this is just nonsense. This is nonsense. Jesus Christ told Peter, he said, On this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church has always, 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 God's always had a witness in every age. He's had a man. He's got a man from the gutter to the boardroom on Wall Street. God's got a man. He has people in the halls of Congress. He has people all around the world who, who love him, know the truth, and give testimony to that truth. But they are the people who are beat down, suppressed, and ignored by the world at large. While they bow to the pageantry, the, the wealth, and, and, and the sheer volume of the, of the congregations of the churches of Rome. And I say that when I say the churches of Rome, I'm referring to those churches that evolved out of Rome in the Reformation period as well as Rome itself. They ask this question here. They say, who had the right theology? Okay, here's here's the here's the question for them. Okay, we've got we've got Rome who says that. The Pope isn't the Antichrist. And you've got the Reformation that says the Pope is the Antichrist. And the question they're asking is who had the right theology? Well, let, let me say this. John said that even now there are many Antichrists in the world. You know, we got an Antichrist in the White House today. Amen, 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 amen. If you are not a child of God, you are Antichrist. But when the Bible speaks of the man of sin, it's not talking about simply the spirit of disobedience that worketh in uh, that work, that work, the, uh, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, which is the spirit of Antichrist. It's talking about a particular man. Yeah. And it's very clear. The man is identified in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 as the one who sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, who demands worship who sets himself up. And in the book of Revelation, it speaks of how that, that, that the false prophet is going to, to force every man, woman, boy, and girl on the face of the earth that he possibly can get in the line to do it, to take the mark of this man who is referred to as the beast. He is an individual in Scripture. That's not some fairy tale that was cooked up by John Darby. I've shown you historically many centuries before John Darby came along, all the way back to the second and third century, that there are people who believe that exact thing. Amen. They want to deny it, they want to suppress it, but when they do so, they themselves are embracing the teachings of Rome and, and, and doing the same thing that they're accusing us of doing of setting forth a false witness, of holding on to a late doctrine. Well, what did it say here? What did it say here? It said that until, this is a writing from one of their sites. It said, it, I read to you where it said that, that, uh, that they discovered Christ, and then in the light of Christ, they discovered the Antichrist. They said that the gospel had not been preached in the world for the span of time between uh, when, when uh, uh, Constantine uh, wrote, brought the Roman Empire into a, uh, from a political into a religious uh, theme and Rome became identified as Christianity, that there had not been any cr true Christianity on the face of the earth, that it was ruled by Antichrist from that point all the way up until the Reformation period. And I say to you again, where are the witnesses for Jesus during that time? Who are the people? How about the Waldenses, Albigenses? How, where are they? They say they were none. There were none. It's simply not true. Simply not true. Who had the right theology? And here's their argument. Those who were burned at the stake for Jesus Christ. Of course, everybody knows about the Roman Inquisi uh, Inquisition. You know what they did. You know what they did in Spain. They went in, they, they burned, they looted, they pillaged, they tortured people. 
uh, for their faith. They, they hated Jews. They murdered Jews by the millions. They murdered Albigenses, Waldenses, all these other little uh, Christian sects by the millions. And they say, okay, well, wh who's the proper witness? Those who were burned at the stake for Jesus Christ or those who lit the fires? Who had the true Bible doctrine, the martyrs or the persecutors? Who had the correct interpretation of the Antichrist? So who died, those who died trusting in the blood of Christ or those who shed the blood of God's dear saints? Dear friends, now this is a smack at us, but they call it Jesuit futurism, is now at war with the Protestant Reformation by denying its power-packed application of prophecy to the Vatican. The Futurist School of Bible Prophecy was created for one reason, one reason only, to counter the Protestant Reformation. In fact, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we've looked at this thing in past lessons, and I've shown you historical witnesses to the pre-tribulation rap pre rapture of the church. And it's undeniable. It's undeniable. But they say, well, who had the right one? The, one, the right testimony, Rome who was burning people in the Inquisition or the Reformers? Okay, well let's ask that question. Who by virtue of their actions has the right to claim that they have the truth? We know that Rome was a murder and monstrous uh, thing that they... I mean, man, it, they took people in torture chambers, tortured them to death, invented the Iron Maiden, every type of thing you can imagine. Took people, had them drawn and quartered, tie horse, a uh, horse uh, to each arm, to each leg, and, and then whipped those horses and ripped the people asunder. All of that stuff. And it's right to point that out, to say how evil that is. But, Let's look at the Reformation for a minute here. The history of the Calvinist Inquisition is something that you never hear, but it's very real. Defense of Orthodox faith against the prodigious errors of the Spanish. Now, this is uh, from a, 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 a letter by John Calvin himself. Defense of Orthodox faith against the prodigious errors of the Spaniard Michael Servetus published in early 1554. This is what Calvin said. Whosoever shall now contend that it is unjust to put heretics and blasphemers to death will knowingly and willingly incur their very guilt. This is not laid down on human authority. It is God who speaks and prescribes a perpetual rule for his church. The church rules. The church rules. Not Christ. The church. It is not in vain that he banishes all those human affections which soften our hearts, and that he commands paternal love and all the benevolent feelings between brothers, relations, and friends to cease. Do you hear what Calvin said? He said that God commands and banishes all the human affections which soften our hearts. It seemed to me like Paul said, be you kind one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God hath forgiven you for Christ's sake Amen. he commands paternal love that's, that's your love towards your children he, he said that God commands paternal love and all the benevolent feelings between brothers relations and friends to cease in a word that he almost deprives men of their nature in order that nothing may hinder their holy zeal why is it so implacable a severity exacted uh, by that but that we may know that god is defrauded of his honor unless the piety that is due to him be preferred to all human duties, and when, that when His glory is to be asserted, humanity must be obliterated from our memories. In other words, if we are to glorify God, every affection that we have for those around us, that, by the way, God put in us, it's the fruit of the Spirit, is love, peace, joy, gentleness, meekness. There's no room for that in Calvin's theology. 
not when it comes to defending the faith. These are his word, his words. He said, why is so implacable a severity exacted, but that we may know that God is defrauded of his honor unless the piety that is due to him be preferred to all human duties, and that when his glory is to be asserted, humanity must be almost obliterated from our memories. Many people have accused me of such ferocious cu cruelty that I would like to kill the man again I have destroyed. Not only am I indifferent to their comments, but I rejoice in the fact that they spit in my face. That's John Calvin in regard to the murder of Michael Servetus. You know why they burned Michael Servetus at the stake? Because he denied the eternal uh, generation of the Son. When he looked at John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word of God says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He looked at 1 John 5.7, says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And he said, hmm, the Son had no beginning. He was in the beginning. The Son is God. And that violated the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. And he wouldn't recant it. He wrote a paper about it opposing Calvin's retaining this Roman Catholic doctrine. And Calvin became so enraged that he had the man burned at the stake. Just one of many. One of many. I've told you before what they did to Anabaptist. You know why they get an Anabaptist? That means a rebaptizer. The Anabaptists were never part of the Reformation. They were never part of Rome. They came from the Waldenses, the Albigenses, all the groups that they say weren't Christians. And what they would do is when they came upon somebody, uh, uh, somebody and they evangelized them and they received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and by faith uh, uh, were plunged beneath His blood and washed and cleansed from their sins and made a part of the body of Christ, they took them out and they baptized them and ignored the infant baptism that had been imposed on them by the reformers or by Rome. So they called them the rebaptizers, the Anabaptists. And their favorite form of punishment for the Anabaptist was to take them to a river, take them to a horse trough, to dip them uh, uh, three times and only bring them up twice. They said that they dipped the dippers that it was a joke to them that's what they said that's what they said okay, let's read a little more of Calvin preface to his commentaries July 22nd 1557 he wrote these words to these irreligious characters and despisers of the heavenly doctrines I think that there is scarcely any of the weapons which are forged in the workshop of Satan which have not been employed by them in order to obtain their object and at length matters had come to a state that such an end should be put to their machinations in no other way than cutting them off by an ignominious death, which was indeed a painful and pitiable spectacle to me. They no doubt deserved the severest punishment, but I always rather desired that they might live in prosperity and continue safe and untouched. Well, compare that to the above quote. But he said, Many people have accused me of such ferocious cruelties that I would like to kill again the man that I have destroyed. I'd kill him twice if I could. In his comments on Exodus 22 and Leviticus 24 and Deuteronomy 13, Calvin wrote, Moreover, God himself has explicitly instructed us to kill heretics, to smite with a sword any city that abandons the worship of the true faith revealed by him. In his letter to the Marquis Pet, Chamberlain up to the King of Navarre in Spain, 1561, he wrote, Honor, glory, and riches shall be the reward of your pains, and above all, do not fail to rid the country, country of those scoundrels, Anabaptists and others, who stir up the people to revolt against us. How dare them have the audacity to stand against us, the church? They know that God has set us to rule. They're nothing but a bunch of other popes is all they are. They, they took the one pope, dethroned him, and set up thrones for themselves and carried on the very practices of the whore of Rome in the name of God. These are the people who deny 
the root, the source of those that deny the pre-tribulation rapture. I, what time is it? Anybody know what time it is? 10.30. Okay, I've got some time here. This is a quoted... Uh, how many of you ever heard of Philip Schaeff? He's, he's, a, a, he's a church historian, well-respected man, church historian. In Schaeff's History of the Christian Church, Volume 8, he wrote these words. He said, The penalty against heresy, idolatry, and blasphemy, and barbarous customs of torture were retained. This is talking about the re re reformers. After the, the Catholic Inquisition where they tortured and killed and maimed all kinds of people. When, after the reform, reformers had reformed the Catholic Church and set up their own church, the death penalty against heresy, idolatry, and blasphemy, and barbarous customs of torture were retained. Attendance at public worship was commanded on penalty of three saws. That's a, a fine. Now, you, give me $300. You didn't go to church last week. Watchmen were appointed to see that people went to church. The members of the consistory, that was the organization that they set up to enforce ecclesiastical law. Sounds noble, doesn't it? The members of the consistory visited every house once a year to examine the faith and morals of the family. Every unseemly word and act on the street was reported and the offenders were cited before the consistory to be either censored and warned or to be handed over to the council for severe punishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah they brought the gospel to light, didn't they? They were filled with the spirit of God's filled with the spirit of hell. It's what they were filled with. Martin Luther said of Calvin's actions in Geneva, with a death sentence they solve all argumentation. This is from uh, Jurgen L. Nevy, A History of Christian Thought, Volume 1, page 285. Martin Luther said, with a death sentence they solve all argumentation. It's pretty simple, isn't it? <laughs> I win. You're dead. I burned you at the stake. You shut up. I won. About the month of January 1546, a member of the Little Council, Pierre Amot, asserted that Calvin was nothing but a wicked man who was preaching false doctrine. Calvin felt that his authority as an interpreter of the Word of God was being attacked, so he completely identified his own ministry with the will of God that he considered Amot's word an insult to the honor of Christ. See the thinking behind this man? You know what Catholics tell you? You know what they tell their members? They say that the only... People who have the authority vested in them by God to interpret His Word is them. And that's precisely the way that Calvin felt about it. James asked this question. He says, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Yeah. Okay, now let's get to our subject here real quickly on the, the timing of the resurrection of the dead. I've read to you from a site, a, a real popular post-trib rapturist, Zach Poonin and others uh, have this website up. And he says that the resurrection of the righteous dead will be an epic, singular future event. The re resurrection of the dead in Christ will explode into holy history. Christ will raise up his people at his coming on the last day of this present evil age, and so will the rapture. He says that the rapture... There is nothing vague and precise here. We are not talking of, of the last days. Jesus told us it would be the last day. Beware of Bible teachers who say that the last day is general reference to the last days. Days, thereby denying this discreet blockbuster future 24-hour day in time. Don't let anyone stretch out the last day like a piece of gooey taffy. taffy. And so in, uh, what, the, what he's saying is the rapture is bundled in with the resurrection as a single harpezo, that's a snatching away, that's the Greek word harpezo, snatching away event that will flash into history in a twinkling of an eye and that the rapture tied in with the resurrection of the righteous dead will come at the last day of this age. That's their authority for rejecting a pre-tribulation rapture. Okay, well, let's compare their teaching with the teachings of Rome. I've been saying a lot about the influence of Rome on the Reformers. 
And these men are reformed in their theology, by the way. They identify themselves with Calvin, Luther, and all that. Comparison of the teaching. This is from the... Uh, from a Catholic website, Part 1, The Profession of Faith, Section 2, The Profession of the Christian Faith, Chapter 3, I Believe in the Holy Spirit, Article 11, I Believe in the Resurrection of the Body. This is from a Catholic Catechism. Number 988 of the Christian Creed, The Profession of Our Faith in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in God's creative saving and sanctifying action culminates in the proclamation of the resurrection of the dead on the last day and in life everlasting. Article 989, we believe firmly and hence we hope that just as Christ is truly risen from the dead and lives forever, so after death the righteous will live forever with the risen Christ and that he will raise them up on the last day. In other words, the Catholic Church also teaches one resurrection that's all-inclusive of church-age saints and Old Testament saints and tribulation saints that takes the place at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ as you read in Revelation chapter number 19. Now, let me ask you, who, who's getting their doctrine from Rome? Seriously, folks. Who, who is the one who's in agreement with Rome? I'm telling you, though, look at it. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And, brother, th this idea, see, what they've done, they've taken, they totally deny the, distinct, the biblical distinctions that there are between Old Testament saints who are under the law. New Testament saints who are under the gospel of the grace of God and tribulation saints who have uh, to endure the persecutions and, 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 and they deny the very purpose, the very purpose of the tribulation period. And it's just, what did he say here? Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 2, Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. It's God whipping His covenant children, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's literal physical offspring for their rejection of Him in the Old Testament times, their rejection of their Messiah when Jesus was upon the face of the earth, their continued rejection of Him all through the church age up until the tribulation period starts. The church is called out of here. God turns His attention directly back to Israel. The two witnesses stand at the mount in Jerusalem at, at, outside the Wailing Wall and begin to preach to them that they need to repent and turn to God and know that their Messiah has already come and He's coming again. And He's going to prepare them for the second advent. And if you read Zechariah 14, you'll see what happens when that occurs. They're going to receive Him. If you read Matthew 25, you'll see what happens when that occurs. The ones that believed the ones that trusted will enter into the kingdom prepared uh, from the foundation of the earth. The ones that don't will be turned into hell. Brother Tony, they, uh, I was talking with a guy and he said, well, God, they rejected God's uh, mercy and His word and so God uh, rejected them. But what He made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Israel was an everlasting. He said an everlasting. I will be their God and they will be my people. Said, your children that will issue forth from your loins, he told him. He said they may not be faithful, but he will be faithful. He is faithful, brother. If God can break that covenant, which is everlasting, then he can break the covenant of salvation with the church. Exactly. Life. Yeah. And since he ain't going to break his word because he said he honored it above all of his name. He's going to finish that which he begun. And he tells the church that he said, He which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus, Jesus Christ. God, Christ in you working his, his good will and pleasure. It's so easy just to 
just to say, well, everything piles up and not to study and easy to believe it. But as you read this book, he commands us in 2 Timothy 2.15 to study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the words of truth. There's divisions in the book. Amen. Amen. There are divisions. And, man, I mean, you know, it's... I don't, I don't, the thing that gets me, I, I didn't know who Darby was. I don't know who any of these guys were until I started studying this stuff. I never read a book by him. I read this book, this one right here. And the thing that amazes me is how the things that, that are just so clear to me from Scripture, are they reading the same Bible? Are they ignorant of what it says and, and then just letting it speak to them or... Is somebody feeding it to them? You know, have they, are they preconceived? Everything that they've got. I, I, I don't, you know. I know this. The Lord knows them that are His. Amen. And when the shout comes, I'm going, and so are they. And it don't matter if, if like you told Jack, when, when he says mount up, it don't matter if you believe in a white horse or not. You're going to get on one. <laughs> and, and, uh, if it turned out that I'm wrong, that's fine too. I'm still going to heaven. But I cannot in good conscience uh, not teach what I believe God has shown me. But then I cannot be as bold as Calvin is to stand up and say, what did he say? He believed that his doctrine, was that, that his authority was God's authority and that the church should rule. And I, I, nobody got that authority. You've got to study God's word Seek his face in prayer. Let the Holy Ghost teach you Amen. the truth of Scripture. Just pray, God, I want the truth. That's what I want. And you'd be amazed what he'll show you. He said, he said uh, 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 call unto me and I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33. 3. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this time together. Lord, I pray, Father, that, uh, that you help prepare my heart for the trip to Haiti, Lord. And God, uh, bless this service to come in Jesus' name. Amen.